here that you actually want to start and uh, present something to Tammy Derrickson. Yes, I do. Thank you. So I'll, I'll keep the time limit on myself here too. Uh, we received a citation from the state of Wisconsin um, recognizing the city of Middleton for its uh, uh, becoming the first dementia friendly city in this area of the state. And the citation reads, whereas in 2014, the city of Middleton passed the initial proclamation to become a dementia friendly community. Whereas a dementia friendly community is one that cares about its neighbors, one that listens to the feeling of its residents with dementia, one that sees the signs, one that understands the needs and one that acts. And whereas a dementia friendly community is a place where people with dementia will live as independently as possible, where they will be valued and respected, where they will engage in activities that will take for granted and will be supported as these activities become more difficult that we all take for granted and will be supported as these activities become more difficult where the changes in the person will be noticed, understood, and accepted. And whereas one in eight people over age 65 have some form of dementia and the majority are living in the community. And whereas the city of Middleton was the first community in Dane County to become dementia friendly with the mission to decrease stigma and raise awareness through education to support and enable all individuals to participate in and contribute to the community. Now, therefore, the members of the state Senate on the motion of Senator John Urbanbach and Representative Diane Hesselbein do hereby commemorate the initial proclamation of the city of Middleton as a dementia friendly community. And this is what the citation looks like. And the senior center is the appropriate location uh, for it. And they played a, a huge role in uh, the city's becoming dementia friendly uh, back in 2014. Thank you, Mike. And if there's a, anyone else who may want to speak, please raise your hand and you will be recognized for three minutes. Anybody else who may want to speak, I do not see any raised hands. There's some. Pardon me? Yes, there's, there's a hand up. Katie wants there to is? speak, Katie Larry. Oh, okay. And yeah, so please go ahead and speak. Uh, yes, uh, good evening. Um, I'm a homeowner at 7306 Elmwood Avenue, and I'm here um, appealing the removal of the city-owned terrace tree on my property after suffering an injury in July. Um, I put together a document for the council members that's in your agenda packet, and it shows that I've been in communication with the city regarding this tree since 2015. Um, the documentation includes dates and times of emails and phone calls, and it shows a repeated pattern of neglect, lack of communication, and downplaying the severity of the issue. Um, I've been told multiple times over the years that there are routine maintenance programs for trees. However, in the eight years I've lived here, the city has never pruned a single branch from the tree. Um, however, today I did want to focus specifically on July 7th. Um, on that day, I was walking from my parked car on the street onto my property and tripped over the tree root that was growing into my driveway. Um, pictures of the tree root are included in the packet in Exhibit D, as in boy. Um, you can see the dimensions of the root in your packet. Um, when I tripped, I hit my shin very uh, severely on the cement, and pictures of that initial injury are also in your packet in Exhibit K, as in king. Um, and it's been six weeks, and at this time, my injury has not healed. Um, I have pain while walking and a large lump that's formed on the front of my shin where I hit it. And at this time, my primary care provider has referred me to an orthopedic surgeon to assess the situation and see if um, there's something more serious or potentially assessment for possible surgery. Um, so I'd like to bring the attention to the risk assessment that was performed on April 28th. This was also presented back on the May 18th meeting. And I feel that this assessment neglected to include several items that impact the public safety. Um, the assessment of the roots was not even done. Um, it's pretty clear that the roots are growing up through the driveway, and this section of the assessment was left completely blank. Um, it mentions nothing about the risk to safety, such as how close this is to the driveway, the ability to trip over the roots, the raised sidewalks, the driveways, um, anything like that. 
And the assessment of the crown doesn't include any details about the weak wooded nature of the tree and the past history of branches that have fallen during windstorms, um, which was discussed in Parks and Recreation. And so um, due to my injury and the numerous ways that this tree has become a public safety risk, I'm asking that the city uh, remove the tree. The pruning cannot fix the risk that the roots have caused, including my own personal injury, which is um, incredibly painful. And um, I would ask the council if this uh, risk and injury is enough of a burden to consider this tree a nuisance and remove it. So my request is that the city remove the tree at the full cost of uh, removal and stump grinding covered by the city due to everything I've documented and, um, and discussed with you today. So thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Is there anyone else? Please, if you want to speak, raise your hands. Yes, and I do. Please identify yourself and you have three minutes. Hello, Robert Bartholomew uh, at Middleton. As Middleton begins a search for a new city administrator, it's important that the residents be an integral part of deciding which candidate is best for the city. In a search for a new superintendent, the school district appropriately included a citizens panel to interview and rank the most promising candidates. Uh, Mr. Davis was a member of that committee and likely can attest to how vital that is to make it a community determination in concert with the school board, which candidates will be the best fit for the community. In like manner, uh, Middleton City Panel, uh, through the interview and the ranking method, can decide who is the best chance of meeting uh, the community values and goals. It also provides an opportunity for an initial introduction of the specific candidates to the residents, uh, and plus encouraging resident involvement uh, in um, the city affairs, particularly uh, this critical and far-reaching decision because of the impact the city administrator has on their lives in Middleton. Uh, then the panel's results can be combined with those of the council to determine which candidate will best serve the needs of the city, including the those are the person most beneficial for the residents. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you, thank you, Robert. Uh, I know Katie Nelson has her hand up, but any other citizen before uh, um, I ask uh, Katie Nelson, and Katie, it's, I hope it's not something which is already on the agenda. Okay, so anyone else who wants to speak besides Katie Nelson? I do. I don't know how to raise my hand on the Zoom, but Tim Gary from 7310 Elmwood Avenue. I just want to let the council know that I support um, the efforts to revisit and reconsider the previous decision on the tree uh, in regards to the city uh, tree on Elmwood Avenue. So uh, I think that it needs to go. Uh, the storm that came through a week, week and a half ago uh, was hitting the lines and endangering my lines uh, this is not just Katie's uh, tr uh, lines that are impacted. Uh, it's my house as well. Thank you, Tim. Any other citizen who may want to speak at this time? Any other citizens who may want to speak at this time? Okay, Katie, you're up. It will be something which is not on the agenda. Go ahead. You're on mute, Katie. Thank you. I'm on Park Street in Middleton. My name is Katie Nelson, and I wanted to just sing the praises for the last Saturday's fly-in and car show at the Middleton Municipal Airport. Um, it was a fantastic event with lots of really fancy cars. It was really fun to see a bunch of vintage uh, airplanes flying in and out. And um, I just hope that people will check it out next year because it was an excellent event. Um, this is Middleton's airport and everyone is welcome there. Thank you, Katie. Anyone else who may want to speak at this time? Any citizen who may want to speak at this time? Okay, 
I don't see any raised hands. I'm going to close that part of the meeting and we go on to uh, the presentation. This is the draft personal ordinance, ordinance policy and compensation system changes. And, and this is for discussion only. And it's with the city staff. We're going to start Brian or Bill or Mike. I'll start. Uh, okay, go ahead, Mike. Uh, so recently, the personnel and finance committees have done some work with uh, staff, uh, mostly in closed session with regard to the personnel ordinance and um, start to review employee handbook issues. And Brian's put together this presentation for you to give you an overview of, of uh, where we're at currently. Also. Uh, as an update, we had a couple of employee meetings two weeks ago and heard a lot of um, critical commentary from our own employees about the process. And I wanted to let you all know that um, uh, we should have done the process in a better way and incorporating the employee meetings prior to the uh, uh, bringing to the council the, uh, the personnel ordinance. And I take responsibility for that. It's ultimately uh, uh, my judgment on, on the process and the timing of that. Um, there, um, of the 69 people who attended our employee meetings, uh, the, the vast bulk of the commentary was on uh, the potential removal of longevity pay from the city's uh, benefits plan. Uh, Brian and Bill and I presented the uh, administrative staff's view of how we need to move towards a, uh, a better pay system and the proposal to uh, uh, move longevity pay into standard base pay for employees. It wasn't well received. Uh, there might have been a handful of the employees uh, but they were not likely to speak up in that crowd who were in favor of that uh, of that uh, whole part of the proposal. So um, I thought it would be beneficial for the full council to have uh, the benefit of this overview before we take subsequent steps at, at future meetings, including with uh, the personnel and finance committees um, at, at the next stage. So Brian, if you would uh, like to go ahead with the, the uh, presentation, I think it's all yours. Hey, now, you. Mike, I do want to say thank you for having those staff meetings. That, that was the right thing to do, it's, it's great. Okay, Brian, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Can you go forward a slide? I think two slides. Yeah, uh, one more. Okay, we'll skip the agenda slide because uh, we'll go through these. Um, when I arrived, I took a look, I was charged with taking a look at the administrative structure and administrative documents that manage the city's employees as the human resources manager for the city. What I noticed is that we did not have a coherent, consistent and comprehensive employee handbook, um, that we fell back on the personal ordinance, uh, which is really an authorization document, not necessarily a policy document. Uh, to manage many of the employees. And so uh, over the last year, I've done work on proposing some changes to the personnel ordinance, um, drafting an initial draft handbook and, and a number of other policies that we've attacked. Uh, this slide talks about what the personnel ordinance is and what it is not. The personnel ordinance is really designed to be an authorization document that gives the authority from the council um, to the city administrator and the staff to operate and run staff functions uh, and meet our regulatory uh, compliance requirements that uh, affect employees working for the city. Uh, the ordinance has not been revised since it was written. Um, the ordinance in the way that it looks right now uh, predates uh, Mr. Davis as a city administrator of the city and much of the language um, is inconsistent, outmoded, 
um, and in some places contradictory with other practices and policies that are in place in the city. Next. Uh, this is what the employee handbook is intended to do. The employee handbook is supposed to be a place where employees can go to find general information on most of the things that they would need to know to successfully navigate working as a member of the city. Uh, we don't have a document like this or a resource like this. A number of documents exist on our iSolved um, employee web portal. Some of them are in print um, and out of date. Some of them are inconsistent with each other and some are separate policies and we have a good deal of practice um, that's out in place. We are also missing a number of policies that are essential for employees to be able to access um, that just aren't really written anywhere, especially those things that we've identified during the COVID period where um, we've had to work from home, we've had to do remote arrangements, we've had to deal with uh, very strange leave situations. And so this employee handbook project is to produce and provide a document for all employees to use that will address those specific, th those general things that apply to all employees. Each department is gonna have some specific operational information that they need specific to the things they do, but those things that are foundational for employees in general across the city are foundational for every employee. And we have a responsibility to provide a consistent, um, coherent uh, experience for employees. This uh, handbook is drafted. Uh, it's gone out to all of the department heads twice. It's currently in the department head hands. Uh, for a second time after a number of revisions for the that were sent in the first time. And uh, I continue to work through adding those things that are identified to make sure nothing gets missed or lost. Next. Staffing and selection. There's a staffing and selection policy. Um, this is a manager level policy that will direct uh, the basic processes for how we go about interviewing, advertising, selecting employees, uh, working through promotions, and how do we uh, use and leverage our technical systems and our recruiting software to do this, both to enhance equity as we seek to increase a diverse and inclusive environment for employees in the city. Um, this is something that's currently being drafted. And again, it's, an, it's a manager level policy, but it's referenced in the ordinance and in the handbook. So I wanted to make sure everybody understood that this is another tool um, that has not been updated in some time and falls in this spectrum of work that is being done by the Human Resources Department to provide the city uh, a modern HR structure. Next. Overall, each piece of policy and each process has its place. Um, up to this point, uh, they have not necessarily been placed in those places. Uh, for example, the ordinance when I arrived um, was not in any particular sequence uh, and it was very difficult to find the information. So those things that are policy that uh, are not specifically part of the purview of the council, the that those are move the employee handbook and all of those parts of the overall personnel ordinance are now sequenced from a initial responsibilities across the council and specific staff members through hiring to retirement in a cradle to grave employment experience so that the ordinance follows that track and the employee handbook also will follow that track. Uh, those things that are not in the ordinance but exist, um, they are now in the handbook. Uh, as things are missed, because there is a, kind of a wide spectrum and, and a number of places that things are documented uh, and not always obvious, uh, they are being integrated into the handbook uh, so that everything is out there and we have a continual authorization document through implementation, guidance, and information that will be available for our employees on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay. Here's some of the key changes to the ordinance. Um, previously, uh, the very first one, uh, there is a recommendation to discontinue longevity pay and transition the system and future to achieve internal and external pay equity for grades and positions. And I'll talk about that again um, later. Uh, there are some significant inequities in our pay system uh, and 
in many ways that are exacerbated by the current longevity pay system. Uh, the current longevity pay system also gives an inaccurate picture of total monetary compensation in, in the way that it has been communicated. Uh, recall pay, holiday pay, premium pay will all be standardized across all classified employees across the city. And understand this handbook and the ordinance apply specifically to classified and unclassified employees, seasonal, temporary employees. Um, they do not, does not apply to any of the bargaining unit employees um, that are a part of the bargaining unit for the police or uh, for um, the paramedics unless they are specific general management requirements of employees. Uh, probationary periods will be changed. Um, leave programs and statuses are updated. Um, a number of changes are made. Next. Uh, the handbook will contain a complete remote work from home policy that integrates a number of the lessons that we've learned uh, over the last 18 uh, months as we've gone through the pandemic. Um, it will contain direct access to the forms and resources that employees most often need that oftentimes now they have to struggle to find. Uh, summary of benefits by eligible classes, statuses, and hour breakdowns, which is, is difficult to find at times. Um, it extends tuition reimbursement and professional development as a program to um, all classified employees in the city. Obviously, if funds are available um, only, but uh, that was spotty in its application across the city. This recognizes that it's an important professional development tool for all employees. Um, a number of other uh, policies that were referenced non-existent but still applied are in there. Uh, it also provides a single document um, that will be available in print, it'll be available digitally, and it'll be available on a keyword searchable database so employees will be able to easily find things. Um, we will update it annually or as needed, and it will be distributed digitally um, and acknowledgement required for all employees so they understand what those changes are uh, as they would happen. Next. Bill? Yeah, I, I can uh, take over from here. As part of the presentations that we did with the employees, we included a brief section with some information on the city's budget. Uh, a lot of this was drawn from the budget kickoff meeting that was uh, presented to the Finance Committee earlier this summer. Uh, we want to provide some context of the budget situation facing the city and an explanation on why there are limited resources to deal with some of the compensation plan issues uh, that Brian has talked about and is addressing in his presentation. Um, I'll go over this uh, fairly quickly since a lot of this was in the budget kickoff. Uh, but the city, as, as those on the council know, is divided into separate funds. Our main operating fund with many of our departments and staff is our general fund. Um, when we look at the revenues for the general fund, those are generally fairly stable from year to year. And in times of economic downturn that, that has helped the city that we don't see immediate reductions. Uh, but we're also very limited in how much those revenues can grow. Uh, the largest revenue by far is the property tax, which is li we're limited in how much we can raise by state levy limits. Uh, the next largest source of aids uh, or revenue is aids that come from the state. And with recent state budgets, um, those have been very limited as well. Next. On the expenditure side, uh, as you know, most of our costs are personnel. Uh, wages and benefits are the largest share of our general fund budget. Uh, when we include that, as well as transfers that to other funds that include wages and benefits, it's about two thirds of our operating budget is it our staff and our operating costs. Next. Uh, with the recent state budget that was adopted, it's mostly status quo for municipalities. There were no changes in several of the state aid programs. So shared revenue, expenditure restraint, payment for municipal services, uh, there's no additional funding. We're expecting to receive the same amount that we are receiving in 2021 as we go into the next two years. Uh, there were no changes in the levy limit laws. Uh, there were no additional local sales tax or revenue options included in the budget. Uh, the one area that did have an increase was general transportation aids. And that was a 2% increase, which is about $25,000 within the city of Middleton budget. Uh, there was also discussion in the budget process of a repeal of personal property taxes and adding back in an aid program that's intended to make municipalities whole for those payments, uh, at least at the current level. 
Uh, that was eliminated, um, or the, the, excuse me, the, the bill to, for that was vetoed. Uh, there was a funding identified within the state budget. This potentially could come back in a different form, but right now it's status quo. Next. So when we look at the city's operating budget, there are really three challenges that are continue to drive our general fund budget. And these are, are things that we've been looking at every year as part of the budget process. Uh, the first is the need to phase out the TIF-3 cost recovery payments by the end of the TIF-3 expenditure period in 2026, property tax levy limits, and then limited local revenue options. And if you can go to the next slide. Uh, looking at the first of those, the TIF cost recovery, uh, back following the Great uh, Recession, the city put a program in place to receive additional funding transferred out of our large TIF district, TIF number three, to make payments to the general fund for services provided to properties located within that TIF district. That really helped balance the budget for the city in a very difficult time and avoid major budget cuts. Uh, but as we reach the end of the expenditure period for that TIF district, uh, those payments are no longer going to be able to be made, and we need to phase that out of our general fund budget to avoid having a large hole in our budget in 2026. Those cost recovery um, amounts peaked at just under $1.8 million in 2013 and 2014. Uh, the city had started reducing that amount by $100,000 per year. Uh, in recent years, we've increased that phase out to $150,000 per year. And we're also planning to take advantage of a levy limit adjustment from a TIF subtraction from taking territory out of the TIF district to accelerate that. Uh, we need to get that done by 2026, but the need to phase that out each year means that it's out of the available resources we have in any year, um, that's helping or, or can contributing to restraining those resources available for, for new programs or new costs um, because of that need to phase out. Uh, next slide. Looking at property tax levy limits, uh, Wisconsin has very strict levy limits that are currently in place. Um, increases in the amount we can collect from property taxes are limited to the growth and new construction, and that's all. There's no inflation factor. So for several years now, the city has been using the growth that it's had to help pay for increases in our costs without having that inflation factor built in. Uh, there are some exclusions for debt service, but it's very limited on the operating side. And there, the only way to really go beyond that is through a referendum. If there were approval um, by the council to go to referendum that then the voters would approve, you can exceed the levy limit. Uh, but without that, we're limited to only the increase in growth in a particular year. Next slide. And Middleton is fortunate that it is a growing community and compared to some communities in the state that are not growing, uh, they're in even worse situations. Uh, Middleton's net new construction growth over the past several years has averaged um, just under two and a half percent, 2.4%. That generates about $290,000 uh, per year in that levy limit increase. The numbers that we have from the, the state for our net new construction that we'll be using for our 2022 budget was an increase of 1.8%. And with that being lower than average, that is also restraining us and limiting us for the amount of, of taxes that we can grow. And then finally, uh, local revenue options. Uh, the city has over the years implemented some changes in other revenues uh, to try to provide additional funding. Uh, there was an increase in the hotel room tax rate um, that is now at its maximum allowable rate under state law. We implemented uh, building plan review, which is building in bringing in some additional building uh, revenue from review of plans that would otherwise have gone to the state. Uh, there was a shift made for public fire protection to shift costs from our general fund uh, directly to utility customers and utility bills. And we've also made some changes in our cost allocation for utilities to, to try to get additional resources for services provided by the general fund. At this point, there are, are not many other options left. Uh, there's a wheel tax or a transportation utility is the form that some communities have started exploring. Um, looking at charges for recycling rather than paying that through the property tax um, or possibly making changes with refuse or stormwater utility um, charges. But a lot of those, um, including if we were to, to implement a ref refuse charge would require a referendum as well. So you're in a very similar situation to a, a referendum to exceed the levy limit. 
Uh, so with that, with property taxes being our main source, state aids being largely stagnant, few other revenue options, uh, we're really constrained. And the, the way to really look at increasing revenue would likely to be to go to referendum in the future. Um, unless there are questions, uh, I can wrap up here. Um, I, I think a lot of this, we, we've talked about the, the context before. Um, I will add that as far as our budget process, department budget requests are due this Friday. Uh, we'll be reviewing those and preparing information to go to the finance committee starting in September. And as always, we will also be looking at any other creative ways to try to structure the budget and bring those ideas to the finance committee and council as scenarios as we move into the budget process. I'll turn it back over to Brian. Right, to understand the discussion around longevity pay uh, and some of the issues that I've identified with the city's compensation system, it's important to provide a grounding in how we get here. Um, no one needs to totally understand this. They need to be familiar with it enough so that they can understand when we get to talk about longevity and, and pay equity, where this comes from. Now, the recommendations I make have both have been made both times that we've had Baker Tilly come and do our analysis. So um, this past year and previously in, in 2014, when they did the analysis of our compensation classification system and helped us build our salary plan, um, they identified longevity pay as uh, an older and often no longer used uh, pay program. And longevity pay is simply one of the tools that's out there. How we determine salaries, uh, we evaluate each position by its duties. Um, they're benchmarked to comparable municipalities. There is never a mirror match. And so we compare to as many as possible. We compare the job descriptions. Um, and then a midpoint for the market is derived. That midpoint is where employees' pay is targeted. Uh, anyone at the midpoint that was determined would be an employee who has reasonable tenure, is fully trained, performs consistently well, and occasionally exceeds expectations. Um, below that are newer employees, inexperienced employees, or poorly uh, performing employees, and above that, are employees that perform exceptionally well or consistently and always exceed standards. So the target is the middle of the range. Um, it's not the top, it, it, it always is the middle um, with a span. So each grade is separated by about 6%. We group jobs that have very similar salary midpoints into bands, into grades, so that we don't have uh, a separate uh, salary band for every single job. Uh, they, uh, there's a range up and down by adding and subtracting about 20% generally. Our scale actually is about 13% up and 13% down from our midpoint. Um, all of salaries for employees in a position in that salary grade, if they were a grade one, a grade three, a grade 19, have to fall between that lowest number and the highest number. They can't exceed either range. And again, for someone that is performing well and occasionally exceeding um, expectations and is fully trained, the midpoint is the target. The way we measure that is a tool called a compa ratio. Um, just understand that is the position in the range where one is the center and low one to the left is less than that midpoint and above one is higher. The goal for most employees is between about a 0 0.96 and a 1.04 for those that are competent and experienced and performing as expected. Next. These are the tools that we use to address inequity and the structure of the pay system. One is a cost of living increase. That's what was applied last year. We want it to be as close to the overall wage growth index as indicated by the National Employment Cost Index or ECI uh, as possible to avoid erosion. This is something that we have to do every year. <laughs> Otherwise, our salary structure and the earning power of our employees just decreases as cost of living and inflation hits them. The other thing that we need to do each year um, is to make market rate adjustments applied at the employee level based on the position and their relative position against that. So if someone is exceedingly low in their range and they are making that performance and they have been here and they're fully trained, we should be doing something to move them towards the middle of that range. It's the value of the specific work and the person doing that work in that job. Um, 
Ideally, we would be able to apply merit pay also. It is not the same as a market rate adjustment. Merit pay recognize individuals for exceptional performance over sustained periods. And that is what we would be able to move people forward um, to and above the midpoint, but ideally above the midpoint um, once we have an effective way to move our employees from their initial starting rate to uh, an equitable market rate and solve some of the internal issues. Next. These are some of the design issues. We op operate in a closed loop as Bill talked about. So there is no way to inject more money. We can't sell more, we can't do more to make more money, but our employees um, rightfully so experience, uh, gain experience um, and skill and increase in their need for compensation every year. Um, the balance of costs and benefits is different from us, for us through the, uh, the private sector. And although we compare with other cities, um, they are different from us. And no comparison is anything other than simply instructive. It's not perfect and it's not something that we absolutely need to do. COLA has not kept pace with the employment cost index oftentimes. Last year, the employment cost index um, increased by 2.25%. So that meant that the center of each range and the lower and top end of each one of those ranges increased by 2.25%, um, but we were able to apply a 2% COLA. So the earning power um, with, of about a quarter percent was lost across the board simply because we were constrained under COVID. Um, we've had an inconsistent ability to provide merit pay over the years, and we do need to build in some flexibility uh, and nimbleness into our pay system because at some point we may be faced with a um, long or short transition to a 15 dollar per hour mandatory national or local uh, minimum pay. And we'll have to restructure and, and be able to manage that for everyone without having to take the most grievous steps in reducing labor to be able to, re to meet that kind of um, increase in pay. Next. These are the results of our current system. Um, and I would say uh, in, in some ways ineffective. So when we talk about that compa ratio, this shows those compa ratio measures. Um, the bottom of our ranges for all of them fall at uh, 0.87. The top of all our ranges fall at about a, a, a 1.13. Um, when I initially did analysis, when I arrived at the city and we worked through salaries last year, this was the breakout. 58 of the 123 classified employees this doesn't include anyone in um, one of the bargaining units. It doesn't include seasonal or limited term employees either who have a fixed wage. It includes those general municipal employees across the 13 departments. 58, 58 of them uh, were below in the lower side of uh, where they should be for a comp ratio. 26 were in the middle where you would expect most of your employees in an organization like this that has pretty good tenure and high experience. And 39 um, were on the very high end. So where we would expect a bell curve distribution uh, for employee salaries, or at least close to a bell curve, uh, we have an inverted bell curve. And, and this is an indication that the pay system is not working effectively to manage people through those pay cycles and reflect their value um, according to the market rates. Some of this, not all of it, but some of it, it's exacerbated by longevity pay. Next. This was the proposal I made to the Personnel and Finance Committee um, that we freeze longevity pay amounts at the current rates and discontinue the practice um, at the end of this year. So anyone that by the end of this year has received a longevity payment, even if it's their first one in the first pay period of December, they would have that frozen and rolled into their base salary. So no reduction in current earnings is lost. Um, then future longevity increases for four years until the program would expire, would be rolled back into the ability to manage some equity within the system um, and uh, address market rate increases for those that are falling below or stuck at the bottom of a bracket and not increasing. And over the length of a, 
of the future until the last person is gone. As employees leave, we would redirect discontinued longevity market longevity amounts back into that also. Um, at this point, I'll kind of address one of the questions that's come up. Uh, so each employee, we publish a salary uh, plan for the classified city staff each year. Um, that shows the salary that is broken out for each employee across 26 pay periods, but that is not their total direct monetary compensation. Um, because longevity pay is not a bonus, it's not discretionary, it's not variable based on performance, it is um, based direct compensation for which we pay into the Wisconsin retirement system and we pay against retirement. And so um, even though their pay is received in two modes, one, one in a lump sum and one spread across um, the 26 pay periods, those two numbers together um, are their w, W2 income and their direct monetary compensation for the year. And, th and that is um, a difference in looking at how compensation is received. And, and I, I know that that has been a difficult discussion, but in fact, that is how our employees are paid. Okay, next. Um, this is some of the benefits to the plan as I had proposed. Please go back one. Uh, plan as I proposed. It's cost neutral or cost subtractive. Um, initially, across, by the end of the four years, the council will need to find a way um, in concert with myself and, and Bill Burns uh, to bifurcate the budget for personnel so that some is addressed to COLA and some is addressed to market rate so we can continue this progress forward and preserve an equitable system once the equity is returned to it. It creates a systematic use of the funds in line with basic uh, compensation principles and, and market rate um, principles. Um, and it's in incremental in application. Next. This is just a snapshot of some of the equity issues. Um, there are significantly more equity issues that I've talked with uh, uh, Mike Davis and Bill Burns about. Um, but what I have found is that in some ways exacerbated, in some ways separate from the longevity pay issue, um, we do have some identified uh, issues in uh, equitable pay across those employees that come from diverse backgrounds and across gender gaps um, within the city uh, that absolutely have to be addressed um, within a closed loop system where there is not. Uh, a way to mine a ton of new money to be able to address that. And these are just a few of the numbers. Next. This is a snapshot of departments. Um, we do have an imbalance across departments also. A couple of departments, excluding the ones that only have one person in them. Um, all of their employees are at or above that midpoint. So they are all receiving um, pay that says that they are uh, competent and occasionally exceeding or consistently exceeding expectations. We have three departments where 100% of the employees are being paid in those brackets that you would expect very new or only reasonably new employees to be paid. Um, and this is split out across and, and very, very um, stark when you take a look by department across the city. Um, there's a specific reason that I didn't um, highlight which departments they are. It's not really relevant which departments they are. It's relevant that we understand that there is a systemic issue um, across the city in how we address um, equity across departments, across employees, and recognize for the value of positions uh, separate from longevity. Next. There's been a number of recommendations um, or questions during the employee meetings. Why don't you just grandfather out longevity? Uh, doesn't everybody have longevity? In fact, very few municipalities or public organizations still have a longevity program. Those that do, uh, most of them are frozen like our proposal and um, older employees is only employees that have received them in the past that are getting them. Those that are still in effect tend to cap out at a few hundred dollars a year. Um, we see 
amounts in excess of $7,000 at times going out in longevity payments um, over and above the actual reflected salary, um, but part of their basic direct monetary compensation, um, including cities like Cedarburg, who as of this year abandoned uh, their longevity programs. Um, with that, if you have any questions, I, I can answer them to the best of my ability. Any questions for Brian or Bill or Mike, please raise your hand. This is only for the city council. Okay, Susan West, please go ahead. Susan, please go ahead. You Good have minute, to unmute Susan. yourself. Yeah. Okay, I don't have questions for Brian, Mark, or uh, Mike. But I do have some statements I'd like to make. I attended both of those meetings with city staff. They in total lasted almost five and a half hours. It was very clear to me we have some incredibly upset city staff and very angry. And after listening to it and listening again, I'm beginning to get a good feel for what's happening here. And I think the city, we've got a problem in terms of we need more money for operating. We need to have the uh, employee manual updated, which I think is an admirable cause. But the biggest thing that's making city staff angry is taking away a benefit that they were promised when they were hired, which is the longevity pay. And I've got to admit when I learned that for this year, it's we're only 20,000 short. 20,000 is a lot of money. But when you've promised your staff that they would be getting this and then you take it away, it's demoralizing. And we as a council need to recognize we have some incredibly talented, loyal staff. And I personally don't think it's fair for us to take that away. I'd like to see this whole discussion separated out into different the different issues. One being figuring out how to deal with the longevity pay issue which I think should probably be grandfathered in for those that have already been hired, and figure out a way to be fair for new hires. We also need, as another thing, figure out the equity issues, which is a problem. And we need to have some honest discussions about how we're going to get enough money for our operating budget, because we can't always count on new construction to bring in enough money to cover inflation. And we have to recognize that as we add new construction, if it's especially residential construction, we're bringing in a need for additional services that we need to meet. Okay, so there's a lot of issues, but I really would like to have the longevity pay separated out and there is one thing that I did learn, and this is especially relevant for our police department. The cities around us, Madison and Sun Prairie and so on, and I don't know the exact details, so I could be a little bit wrong on this, but they still have longevity pay. And these are the places where our staff will go when we take this away. So we need to remember that especially since we spend a huge amount of money getting a new officer appropriately trained. It's not worth trying to balance the budget with 20,000 to have an officer leave that we've just spent, I'm not sure how much, but way more than 20,000 to get them trained. So I would really ask council to consider that we've got multiple issues here and they've all been combined into one and it's made it very confusing 
And I can really see why staff are so angry because it seems like we're trying to cover up or deal with one problem by another problem and it's not clear. So I think I'll stop at that. Thank you, Susan. Anyone else from the council who may want to speak at this time? Luke, who's our Luke, go ahead, please. Yeah, and Brian, maybe I, I thought in, in, when you when we initially discussed this that longevity pay actually was not present at a number of the neighboring municipalities. Can you clarify that? It, it is not, and I, if I if I could bring it up on my screen without losing where I am, um, I did a study recently and I asked for feedback from across the state. It is not present in a number of locations. There are places where it is a part of the WPPA police contract, and that is specific to those bargaining units, but it is not a part of their classified or command staff. Um, there are some places where they say that it exists, and, and I've had those cities referenced as they have longevity pay, but it's only legacy longevity pay as they're phasing out the program. And so um, to say it exists everywhere is blatantly false. To say that it exists nowhere would be blatantly false. To say that our system is exceptionally generous um, and costs a great deal um, and in some ways exacerbates inequity, um, that's probably pretty close to true. And, and, and Brian, another quick question on, on that in terms of, um, the, the plan that you put, you're putting forward to summarize doesn't necessarily, um, solve or, or, uh, the issue of the, the long-term operational cost, right? So, um, it, it, that, it, that would be, that would, whether or not we act on this, that would still require a separate conversation, correct? You know, it, it puts in motion us building and committing to a more modern, um, and flexible compensation system that would reliably reflect and adjust for market rate fluctuations in positions, um, address equity and move people through the ranges, um, and so where currently an employee who comes in might wait other than COLA for three years for a single 1% increase in longevity, the potential exists that that 1% is available earlier if they are significantly lower. And it's a significantly smaller sum than 1% for someone that has been here 30 years. Um, it, it is moving the money to where it affects the system and makes it more sustainable in the long term. If we grandfather longevity, it continues to bear the cost of the current system for the next 30 years um, and slowly winds itself down. If we freeze it where it is, um, that cost doesn't increase and we start redirecting funds to be able to do other more modern compensation processes sooner. Thank you. Luke, you have more questions or you're done? Yep, that was helpful. Thank you, Brian. Mm -hmm. Okay, next one is Mark Sullivan. Okay. Brian. No, Mark when, Sullivan, please. Yeah, yeah. Brian, when we had these discussions. Can you, could you reiterate, I, I think there may be some, um, maybe just a lack of commu the correct communication. My understanding, of from all of these discussions with personnel and finance was that there was really no um, change in comp that it had a different form, but that we were essentially holding people harmless to, um, right? In, in other words, we were taking their longevity payments and embedding them into their base comp. And so the reality is, is we weren't taking anything away from them. In fact, you could argue that uh, because we were putting them putting that longevity into base comp, which would then be subject to COLA adjustments, we could actually be giving them more. Is that correct? So here is the concern. And, and um, I can't talk around this concern. It is absolutely true. Um, it is not that there is an immediate loss in income. Um, we would roll whatever the current rate of 
uh, longevity is directly into their base salary because it already is a part of the base salary. It's all direct compensation. Um, and, and you can't separate the two, whether we have ever reflected it correctly or not, we will going forward. It is all base compensation. Um, but in the future, we would freeze at that rate and we would see no increases. So the frustration among many employees is that I was pro I have been here for 22 years and I was promised that at 23 years, um, I would get 6% but now you're going to freeze me at five because I have 22 years and I'm losing out and I could lose X amount of money in the future. Um, no one loses income from 1231 for current income and uh, COLA is calculated on top of that. But the money that would have increased longevity or if we went with a grandfather plan would increase it for those that um, have received at least one payment um, that money would still go to them under that, but that reduces our ability to be flexible and, and address the other issues. Does that answer your question, Mark? Um, maybe the, maybe the better you know. way to explain this would be, have you or Bill run some scenarios where, where you took someone at different stages of longevity and ran them out for 10 or 15 years to get to retirement age to see what the impact of these, this change would be versus the status quo? Yes. And it what varies. Is it varies widely by where they are and what their rate is now. And if they are expected to promote into another position, uh, the problem with longevity is those um, positions that receive the most in base pay tend to also be the ones that have been with the city longest. So the, the cost grows in a re relatively uncontrolled manner at the top end and a relatively meager manner at the bottom end, not addressing any of the equity or movement to the mid of the mid of the range issues. Um, in the end, uh, the question is, do we, do we stop a system that most other cities have stopped in one way or another, grandfather it out or freeze it either way, and deliberately move to a new way of managing compensation or do we um, keep one? My recommendation from the beginning has been that we are best served by freezing it, as painful as that is, uh, and, and moving forward more aggressively, but that, that doesn't have to be the answer. And one last question. Is there anywhere in anyone's employment agreements, something to the effect that we have promised this benefit for their tenure in the city? There is not. It is perceived as a promise because it is a benefit that has existed, but it is not a part of any contract. We are an at-will employer. Um, we have the ability to change the compensation system mode um, and tools that we use at any time. Mark, you have more questions? No, that's all. Thank you. Okay. Any of the other council members who haven't spoken? Emily? Yeah. Um, you know, Brian, thank you for going over a lot of these, these issues. They're, it's a very tough you know, situation. I, I understand what Susan's saying with saying, uh, in saying that she attended meetings with staff, uh, that there's some concerns, maybe lots of concerns if it's five hours. Um, I guess my question would be more to Mike. Uh, do you feel, Mike, um, since, since you brought up that, that part of the issue at the start was just the communication channel of, these, of this potential change, do you feel that after talking with uh, the staff, if if there's some understanding or some, you know, feeling of change or like like a support? Because really, we are budgetary, you know, constraints, as, as stated by the PowerPoint. Um, but Mike, do you feel that that some of them are understanding this or is there still more like a, a discrepancy because of of what he was just saying and that it's not written, it was perceived. So it, is there 
Is there changing in of, of employee understanding? That's a great question, Emily. And I do think that during the course of our five and a half hours that we did, we did get more understanding of the city's position from an overall standpoint. Um, I don't think that meant as much in terms of how individual impacts are calculated by the employees and their uh, future income growth that they expect from the longevity pay plan that's in place. Uh, I did make the point during the course of the discussion that the council had covered the decrease in pensions that would have been required by the state back in 2011. And that was not ever promised to employees when they first started their employment. But the council made that move and did it at my recommendation at the time. So, you know, there, to Brian's point, there's real, really no promise other than the collective bargaining agreement with uh, now with just the police officers that uh, they're entitled to longevity pay. Um, and, you know, so we had a good discussion. We had a good exchange of views on that. And we know that we have uh, what really is a zero sum game here in terms of compensating our employees fairly, trying to secure uh, employees for the long haul and without means by which to, to do the, to move people from the bottom up to middle very quickly. We've tried with merit pay increases over the last several years, um, usually around $25,000 a year, and that doesn't add up to a whole lot when it comes to making those kind of moves to the middle of the pay range for um, our newer employees who tend to be younger as well. So uh, that's the rub with this whole with this whole thing. If we could allocate um, $100,000 a year just towards uh, building in more pay equity within the system, uh, we could do that. But we don't have that luxury right now and that would foreclose the opportunity to add new employees to meet our growing demands for uh, maintenance and public safety. Emily, does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay, Luke, who's our Luke? Go ahead, please. I just want to reiterate a point that was made earlier that I think is worth uh, doubling down on, which is this is the result of you know the very strict levy limits that have been put on us by the state government, and the reality of that is is that I don't think there's an appetite. Uh, to see that change from a statewide perspective anytime soon, at least under the current, you know, uh, shakeup of it. And so while I totally agree, and I think that this is, um, uh, you know, a, a, a very difficult conversation to have at the local level, I think we need to always keep in mind that there are cascading effects that are happening at a statewide level that are frankly causing a lot of these difficult conversations here at a local level. So, um, I just want to commiserate in somewhat in, to a certain extent with Brian and Mike and others that I, I have no doubt that you guys don't want to be in this position, uh, but uh, the, we're, the state is largely forcing our hand uh, at least to have this type of conversation. Okay, I think we probably got to move on. I do want to say thank you. I still have some questions. Okay, go ahead, Susan. Uh, I mean, Brian said that there's other, most places in the state are getting rid of longevity inside at Cedarburg. When I have talked to members of the police department, I'm being told the city of Madison, I think it's Sun Prairie, Verona, I know the chief is on this, he could probably tell me, still do have longevity pay. And we've got to consider that because we're not gonna lose officers to Cedarburg. We will lose them to Madison. So does Madison still have longevity pay? Does Dane County? Madison, Dane officers? County and Verona all have uh, substantial uh, longevity pay. The other smaller municipalities uh, do not for the most part, or if they do, 
they're very small amounts like in Sun Prairie. Okay, thanks for making that clear more, Mike. So if I, if I could Ma just... Just, just one minute. Mike, so Sun Prairie and Verona and Madison, they have- Verona, Madison and Dane County, to my knowledge, still all have uh, substantial longevity pay programs. Okay, thank you. Brian, go ahead. Um, I, I don't have the sheet in front of me. I, I really wanna say that Sun Prairie has a longevity program for the WPPA contract unit. Um, and that is the extent of it and that they have done away with it or are phasing it out as, as we're talking about going forward. Um, so there will be longevity plans. Some places there may not. And when we speak about the police department, so I, I want to be very clear. Um, this is about the city and we are a single organization is the city and the pay equity and compensation program that we develop has to deliver equally supportive equity and compensation support for the city, for all departments in the city, period. That that is our charge as a staff to do that. And that's this recommendation. Um, when we look at this, the longevity uh, program is in the WPPA contract. Should they choose not to negotiate that away? And I'm not going to discuss negotiations or anything else, but should that stay in their contract? It stays because that is a part of that agreement between the city. We are talking about the classified and unclassified staff in the city. We are not talking about the police officers um, who are in the bargaining unit. We are talking about those in the police department that are not in the bargaining unit. We are talking about the command staff, but they are part of the classified staff for the city. They are not part of a bargaining unit. And so um, there's, there's always a lot of blurring lines to try and make a point. Um, make sure that you're not blurring the lines to just try to make the point. Thank you, Thank you Brian. And any other council members who has not spoken, please raise your hand. Any other council member? Okay, I don't see any raised hands. I do want to say thank you to Brian for starting this process and to Bill and Mike. I know starting this conversation is hard, but uh, we will reach some good compromise. Thank you to all three of you. Okay, so. We are on to the approval of the consent agenda. Um, need a motion to approve. This is Robert. I would make a motion to approve the consent agenda. Need a second. This is Luke, I'll second. Okay. Any questions or comments? And, uh, and Robert, you had some question about the minutes. That uh, thing was handled okay, right? Yes, uh, the, the minutes have been provided to council and to the public. Um, so they're out there and I, I liked what I saw. I thought they were accurate. So I, they are part of my motion to approve the minutes along with every other part of the consent agenda. Okay. Thank you, thank you so much. Any other questions or comments? All those in favor of the approving the consent, consent agenda, it has seven different items. Uh, say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay, so the motion passes. We are on to the next item now. Which Mr. is- uh, Mayor. Mr. Mayor. Could I ask that we um, defer this old business until after the closed session? Is that okay with the rest of the, if somebody has any objection to that, let me know. Otherwise I will do just that. So we have uh, this item under the, in the closed session. Okay, so we move on to the agreements. Item number one. Amendment to Hangar Land Lease Agreement between City and the Capital Flight LLC and Oregon 
community bank relating to hangar lot 41. This is Luke, I will move approval uh, at, at for the amendments. This is Robert, I will second the motion. Okay, any questions or comments? Just to be clear, this is the revised version that uh, should have been on, <laughs> should have been delivered to all the alders today. There was an error in the prior version in the packet. Right, it was a, it was a numerical calculation that was off and basic, the basic information hasn't changed, but the, one of the numerical calculations was off and now it's corrected as I, as I understand it. That's correct. Okay. So it was only the calculation. Now I, I have a question for Mark. Mark, uh, what the, Land Commission had approved, if, I, if I'm correct, that building was 30 feet by 40 feet. Is that accurate or it was 35 by 45? Uh, we've identified subsequent to the Plan Commission's review of the design, we've identified the exact land lease area. And this is the maximum building footprint that could be supported comfortably without encroaching into any of the setback areas. Okay, so so this is uh, it, 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 to answer more specifically, Mayor. Uh, this is this would allow a building that's slightly larger than what the plan commission approved, but the design would be very comparable to what the plan commission approved. It, it could be a very minor change that likely we could consider administratively, depending on the nature of the changes they propose, if any. Okay. Uh, any questions or comments? Please raise your hand if they say, okay, Susan West. Susan, go ahead, please. Yeah, I'm concerned about the comments I read emails today from John Hallett pointing out that this building is going in what could potentially be a road around the airport for delivering fuel and what that would have on future plans and wondering if we should even consider that. Mayor, I can address it. I did not see the yeah. emails. John, John didn't copy me on that, but I did no, address no. that concept. This in is the, the email report. which uh, John has sent to uh, you and I and a few other people and did not send it to Common Council. So I forward that today. I thought, you know, to be all fairness, everybody should see that. Oh, and I also forwarded the email which you had sent as well in response to that. Oh, so I okay. sent both of those emails today. So gotcha. Thank you. Yes. I, but I did address this in the staff report. Um, so I, if you would like to address, I mean, it, it is in this in the what I prepared for the meeting. This is an area that the I, I talked to the airport manager about this. This is not a road that has been actively planned or even really passively planned. It was a concept that was. Um, briefly considered as part of uh, alternative eight as the crosswind runway alternative eight. It's shown in red there. That's what uh, Susan, what you're referring to. Um, but I talked to the airport manager and he says the alignment shown with the green line um, or possibly an alter alternative to that going straight off the end of the runway, the, the taxiway, excuse me, that would be sufficient. The area that's shown in red and as well as blue goes through a stormwater detention basin, which would have to be modified to accommodate that perimeter road and it would add impervious surface area. So there's nothing wrong with using the existing taxiway to facilitate fuel truck movements and, and other service vehicles around the perimeter of the airport. Okay, thank you for clarifying that. That makes it much easier. Yeah, so Susan is right, it limits our options. You know, no, we had two options. Uh, but now it will be one. So Robert Bark. Thank you. Robert. Yep, thank you. Um, the only question I had really is, because um, it was not necessarily addressed, is there's obviously a fence there that needs to be modified a little bit if, if a building goes there. Uh, whose cost is that to move 
or modify the location of the fence. Yeah, that, that will be the capital flight. They right. will pay for it. I just wanted that confirmed. Thanks. Yeah, thank um, you. But that, I have nothing further. Thanks. Susan, you have more questions? No, I'm sorry. Oh. I forgot to lower my hand. Does anyone else on the council has questions? Okay, if there are no questions, the motion is to approve the amendment to Hangar Land Lease Agreement between the City and Capital Flight LLC and Oregon Community Bank relating to Hangar Lot 41. All those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Okay. We are on to item number under the world of uh, bid for professional services, item number one. This is the selection and award for bid to consultant for the city administrative recruitment. This Martha move approval is recommended by the Joint Finance and Personnel Committees. This and is second. Emily, I'll second it. Okay, could you please, uh, somebody, well, who would want to elaborate that part that is, uh, Bill, you want to do it, or Mike? Well, not Bill or, Bill or uh, Brian. Yes, so um, at the joint personnel, uh, personnel and finance committees meeting jointly earlier today, uh, the two proposals that were submitted were presented to them for consideration, along with recommendation by the staff. Um, based on that recommendation and the committee's evaluation of the two proposals, uh, their recommendation was that public administration associates be selected as the consultant to support and conduct our recruitment for the city administrator. Any Questions or comments related to the selection of uh, this consultant? Please raise your hands. This is only for the city council. Okay, I don't see any raised hands. All those in favor of the motion for the selection my, and my hand is the... up. Oh, okay, Emily, please go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. It's okay. Uh, I just want to repeat my comment from personnel. I took a look at. Uh, as we all did, uh, took a look at the paperwork and I was very impressed uh, with the procedure that the, the group is going to go forward with in including, you know, talking to the mayor and the city council, um, getting insights. And they, they were very detail oriented uh, throughout the process. And I appreciate it and look forward uh, to the process of looking for a new administrator. But I also want to say we will miss you dearly, Mike. And with that, thank you. Thank you, Emily. Uh, anyone you. else on the council who may want to speak? Anyone else on the council, if you want to speak, raise your hand. Okay, I don't see any raised hands. So all those in favor of the motion to select for the selection and award a bid to consultant for the city administrative recruitment, which in this case is PAA, say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay, motion passed unanimously. We are on to CSM and flat. This is the item number one. This is the <laughs> transportation project Flat amendment number one for, for the Pleasant View Road reconstruction. This is Please Luke. Move. I will move approval of the amendment number one. Okay, need a second. Ramsey, a second. Okay, any questions or comments? Sean, do you want to briefly elaborate on this one? Seems pretty straightforward. Uh, sure. I didn't sound like there were any questions, but it's a minor design change for all practical purposes to make sure that our retaining wall at the northwest corner of Blackhawk and Pleasant View won't interfere with a private underground stormwater detention pipe. Okay. Any questions for Sean or any other questions? 
Okay, all those in favor of the motion for the transportation project flat amendment number one for Pleasant View Road construction say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Motion passes. We are on to the miscellaneous. Item number one, discussion and consideration concerning city's pandemic response. I, is there anything Mike or uh, Bill or Brian want yes, to discuss? Yes, Mayor, to, today the public health, uh, Dane County Madison came out with a uh, <laughs> for mask wearing indoors in all buildings in uh, Dane County. We have instituted that policy or will institute that policy. Uh, it goes into effect Thursday, August 19th. The current directive from the County Public Health is through September 16th. So it's four weeks in, um, in standing. We're certainly hopeful that the growth in cases in the variant uh, start to subside before we come into another fall like last year where it ran rampant as a virus. And that's something we all need to take very seriously. And so we are going to comply with that mask order for all of our buildings. <laughs> there are exceptions built into the policy, but by and large for most people, mask requiring uh, mask wearing is required in city buildings starting on August 19th, and it's already in effect for our city employees. But Mike, that also includes people that would be visiting the city buildings. That's what I was intending to say. If I did not say that, that was the intent. All people in our buildings, public buildings, are required to wear a mask. Uh, and now, so I would say that... Uh... Mayor Brent would be at the, we are in the process of uh, working out those details. Rather than at the police building, it will be at the Good Neighbor Fast uh, Shelter. You will see here more details very soon. Okay, Emily and then Robert Burke. Yeah, um, can you help me understand, Mike? Is that, um, is the Dane County mask wearing? Uh, inside is that for all buildings in the city or is that just our city is taking the mandatory step oh that's for all buildings in dane county okay so for all indoor activities in mm -hmm. dane county mm -hmm. public health madison dane county is uh, requiring masks to be worn thank you i appreciate that thank you emily any okay robert Burke? uh yes thank you i just want to you know i know um, Mike mentioned that there might be an exception or two here or there, but I just want to uh, share my support for city staff to have, you know, definitively, I want to tell you, you have the right to, sell, to tell people who come in to a city building, guests, visitors, and if they refuse to wear a mask, to say politely but firmly, I'm sorry, we can't help you and you need to leave. And I know that would be true at City Hall. It would be true at probably, I assume, some place like the Bauman Aquatic Center. Um, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe some of these are exceptions. I don't know. But um, I know that this is a sometimes difficult topic. But I, from the Common Council, want to share my support for city staff to say, you have the right to ask people politely but firmly to either put on a mask or leave. And I know that's not a fun thing to say, it's not a fun thing to hear, but it needs to be said. And, and I want you to know that you have our support. Thank you, Robert. Thanks. Emily, you still have your hand up. You got something more? Emily. I apologize, I'll take it down. Oh, okay. Anyone else from the city council who may want to speak. Now this is only the update for discussion and we will move on to the next item, number two, which is the liability insurance renewal and self-insured retention level. 
This is Mark. I'll move approval to raise the SIR to $50,000 as approved by finance. This is Luke. Okay. I'll second. Okay. Any questions or comments? It's uh, simply raising the self insurance retention level from 37500 to 50000 And it will save the city money in the long run. Hopefully. Hopefully, yes. Okay. Hey, I don't see any raised hands. So if there are no questions or comments, all those in favor of the motion to approve the liability insurance renewal and self-insured retention level say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay, motion passes unanimously. We are to item number three. This is the compressed the redistricting timeline, the council representation consideration, city administration and planning staff. So, Mark, you want to take it? Or? I just had a question is is because I'm reading this in, in is the is the desire for a motion in order to recommend a certain number of aldermanic aldermanic districts. Um, or what is the preferred course of action on behalf of the Common Council? I, I think from what I read, it will be messier if we add more. Right. I think it's probably best to keep what we have. It's, uh, I don't think there are big changes, uh, at least uh, which I can see from what Mark said. Susan, you have your hand up? Well, uh, well yes. Luke, is that, uh, does that set up a... Yep, yep, that's fine. Okay, okay Susan West and then Emily Kuhn. I would make a motion that we keep eight aldermanic districts for the redistricting process. Uh, it keeps it simple. Yes, we've grown some, but I think Mark can redistrict. And if we're going into tight budget, times it saves us a very small amount of money because we don't have to pay two more alders okay, or, we need or whatever. This is Mark okay. Opitz, not Mark Sullivan. Yes, Mark. <laughs> yes. Did I say Sullivan? No, you said Mark. Just want to make sure yep. everybody knows that I'm not redistricting. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Mark Opitz. Okay, need a second. Second. And I'm here. I'm sorry, I didn't hear my call. Me called earlier. I'm here in case you have questions. Okay, that's all sorry. right. So now it's uh, next one is Emily Kuhn and then Kathy Olson. Emily? Yeah, I, I thank you for the opportunity to talk. I I'm I'm fine with the eight um, the eight districts, but my concern is uh, is the fact that my district is eighty percent rentals. And I attempted to look up the um, census data for the city, and I saw that 83% of the city is, is white. 17% uh, is our people of, of color. Um, and yet Lakeview Park and the park nearest to me um, are the most diverse in the city. That, that's something that was brought up a few meetings ago. Um, Having a high rental volume in my district, um, based on that park survey, seems to mean that we have a lot of people of color, for which I welcome. I love living in my district. I love bringing my children to the parks and going to school with children who are different than my children. But in saying that, that means there are a lot of people of that 17% living in a tiny little area. Um, and, and it concerns me because I think it influences all of us long-term in our decision-making. Because for instance, I can be very progressive, um, very pro apartments because I'm 80% apartments. Um, also, my other concern is that the people that represent our city on this council are white, but we only make up 83% of the city. So in saying that per capita, 
it would be that my seat should be potentially a person of color and I would welcome someone to run against me. But what I'm saying is, is that if we re keep the districts the same, we won't. the only way that someone could run is if truly they run against me or I step down. And if we want to increase diversity long-term, if we keep it the same as it is, um, we are encoding our council to look the same for the next 10 years. And that's concerning to me. So thank, thank you. Thank you, Emily. I just want to share a little bit with you that uh, I have worked very hard, very, very hard for the past four years to add some diversity to the um, to various commission and committee appointments. And it took a lot of efforts, including some help from your, your mother, that uh, I was able to find some people who look uh, different. And so, so, so after four years, I was successful to get uh, uh, three people uh, of color, but it wasn't an easy. So to think that somebody is going to run for the, mm -hmm. well, anyway, so the, it's just very, very challenging. So And, Kathy, and I do applaud you for those efforts, sir. I, I do want to say that and thank you. Thank you. So Kathy Olson, then Susan West, and then Katie Nelson. Um, Mark Opitz, can you just give us a snapshot of what the change in uh, population in Middleton is? What I percent? Did we increase 25 or? Uh, 25, yeah. as I, I'm sorry? It was 25, yep, that's what the yeah, I was gonna say, it was about 25. I couldn't tell you the exact oh. percentage, but we're at about oh. 21,000 now. So that could potentially be two additional, I mean, it's 25% of our, it could be two, two additional um, council, our districts, because of, if we were trying to keep the numbers the same, I'm, I'm off, I'm fine with having um, the eight seats, but just that, that we all know that this is, Middleton is growing quickly. So thank you. And Katie, well, Katie Nelson, then Susan West, or either way. So Susan West, then Katie Nelson. So. Both work, so go ahead. Uh, this is Susan. I would just ask that Mark, when he's doing the redistricting, I know he has to keep each one of us in our district and then draw the boundary lines, that he also consider uh, the diversity issues in terms of keeping people of color I mean, we've got to be careful on gerrymandering. So do we want to keep equal numbers of every race in each district? That's or not. do we want to, I'm not sure how we want to do it to be fair for including minorities. I would like for it to be as fair as possible for minorities. Thank you, Susan. That's a great point. Are you done, Susan? Yes. Okay. Next one is Katie and then Robert Barr. I want to ask from a standpoint of committees, um, if, if the committees, I'm wondering if the committees think that the alders are um, helping enough um, Sometimes, I'm not sure how many committees everyone is on. I'm on six and I wonder sometimes if I'm not as effective because I'm on, you know what I mean? Uh, that's, I'm just wondering if the council feels that way at all. Okay, well, that's a good point. So, well, that's, uh, Everyone is pointed to minimum of four committees, and uh, in your case, uh, so the other committees uh, point the elders to other committees, and it's up to them whether they want to be pointed or not. Yeah, so is, I, I'm just thinking of from that standpoint. I don't know if more elders would, I mean, help that situation or not. I mean, the math would would say yes, but I'm just 
curious what my fellow elders are thinking on that point. Okay. Well, does anybody want to respond to Katie before we go to Robert Burke? I, I would real quick. I had that yeah. thought too, Katie, today, um, <clears throat> because it would be like, if you add two elders, it'd probably be one or two less committees per person because you'd have to spread it out. So. I would like to comment. I think the mayor appoints us to committees and I think he does do it fairly equally in numbers of committees. I know I'm appointed to three by him. I do serve on a couple of others, two that I can think of at the moment, but that's because the committee elected me, which is a totally different issue. They could have also elected somebody else on the committee. Or a citizen, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think it's, is the mayor, you know, the mayor's hopefully appointing equal numbers and. I'm not yeah. arguing that at all. I don't, I don't feel like I have, you know what I mean? I'm not saying that I'm taking on all of this burden. I'm just wondering if when we think about whether or not to have more alders, if that is part of the equation. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I don't think that adding two more would make a huge difference, but. Okay, Robert Bark. Thank you. Um, that, uh, to start off answering your comment, Katie, I think, I think it, you bring up a really good point. Um, and in the future, I might be more willing to consider, you know, splitting up everything into a larger number of districts to have one or two extra alders. Um, but at this time, we're already in a compressed timeline, I believe, for this. If I'm, if I'm remembering or reading reading the, the topic correctly, I guess I, I still would stand on the side of let's keep it with eight aldermanic districts uh, at this time. But I think it's something for the future to consider whether um, when we have more time to look at it and think about it, maybe maybe an additional aldermanic district or two would make sense. Um, and then the reason I actually so that, that's my answer to you, or thought, that's my thought, I guess. Uh, the reason I raised my hand was about the idea of trying to equally balance, um, for instance, people of color in all the districts. And I just, I laud the, the idea. I just think it's uh, <laughs> nearly impossible uh, without having extremely gerrymandered districts, which I think would be not uh, ideal. Um, I do have people of color in my district, but I will admit that it's less than um, Emily's district. And um, I say it, it should definitely be a factor that's considered, but I don't think it's realistic to say that we would want to try to have, you know, proportionally um, the same number of every ethnic group or, 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 or whatever in every district. It's, it, it, I just think at this point, um, it should be a consideration that can be looked at during how we reallocate the, the wards. But at the end of the day, I think, uh, you know, some districts are gonna be more heavily uh, people of color and some districts are gonna be more heavily uh, Caucasian people, I would guess. Uh, so I would I would just say again we're under a, a, a compressed redistricting timeline, and I would suggest we go with um, eight aldermanic districts. And where that consideration uh, of of changing borders can help add diversity to districts that are otherwise not as diverse, I would I would recommend we we look at that. Uh, but I just, I don't want to see gerrymandered districts. I think that's just bad precedent. That's all that's I have to say. Thank you. That's an excellent point, Robert. And also people have the ability to move. So you're not going to be <laughs> doing this uh, 
Well, uh, I got Larry Beckler and Kathy Olson. Larry, you have some uh, legal question here quickly? I don't have a question, but I just want to point out the procedure. <laughs> um, Mark has been doing this, Mark Opitz, this will think you as your third time now. Um, and he is, um, let me tell you, a real expert in the mechanics of performing a redistricting. But we, but even though we are even more compressed than normal, the, the city is required to redistrict within a 60 day period of when we get the information to do so. So it's always tight. It's just tighter this time. Luckily, Mark's been doing this before and he is, he's obviously already been working on this. Now the decision about um, choosing whether to create more aldermanic districts is not subject to that same timeline. The statute, which in this case is section 62.08 subsection four, says that the council may by a two thirds vote of all its members, but not more frequently than once in a two, any two year period, increase or decrease the number of aldermanic districts. And if it does that, then of course, it has to readjust the boundaries of the aldermanic districts. So why I bring this up is just to point out that on the one hand, if, if the council was ready to, to make a change, it could do so, but this could conceivably be a two-step process. One is the redistricting, which has to happen very quickly. The second is the possibility of increasing or theoretically decreasing the number of alders uh, on the council. I wanna say one more thing that's very important. Uh, obviously we're all familiar with some of the shenanigans that have been done by various bodies that are not the city of Middleton to play with um, districts. I'm just say that as, as non-judgmentally as I can. But um, the same statute, which deals with aldermatic district alteration says in two places, the boundaries of which are ch changed shall be in as compact form as possible. So, you know, we have a statutory direction that when you're doing redistricting, you're supposed to be compact, which presumably would rule out some of the crazy anaconda districts that other legislative bodies have undertaken and could arguably be violative of state statute. That's it. Thank you, Larry. Kathy Olson, then Emily Cohn. Larry, thank you for that clarification. That was very helpful. Robert, I agree with you um, 100%. I'm happy to stay with eight. The only thing I wanna point out is that as Middleton grows, each district gains population, and then I wanna make sure that our citizens are getting the best representation possible. All right, if they get the districts get too big, something gets lost, I think, that um, and how you handle constituent relationships. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Emily Kuhn. Emily? Yeah, I I wanna I wanna restate what I said in the beginning, which is my district is 80% rentals. You all know this. I've said it when we talk workforce housing, I talk about it when we talk about a rent apartments coming on board. So, you know, I added in the diversity piece because we do want to be cognizant of our neighbors and make sure things are flowing. But I also want to, I, I hear what Larry's saying about keeping it compact, but my district in thinking about it is the really the only long north south district. The rest of the districts are either like larger squares because they were I'm thinking of Luke's, he had the airport and business districts. There weren't a lot of people living there. Now he's getting tons of apartments. But almost everybody else's goes east-west. So the reason I'm bringing this up is 
when other alders vote on issues, they're looking at the average of Middleton, which is about half houses, half apartments. If your district is well more over houses, over apartments, you may vote differently than I do every time when apartments come up. And so when we think about policy long-term, we have to think about who we represent in our district. My district is 80% rentals. And if you're okay with that, then that's where that is. Thank you, Emily. Any other questions or comments from the city council elders? Okay, so the motion is to keep the um, city council at eight elders. All those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Mark, do you need any, I, I guess, uh, as Larry said, you have done this before and uh, two times, so you will take care of it, right? And I just Mark, wanted to- Mark Opitz. Yes, and I just want to say that I'm working with uh, the clerk, Lori and Daphne on this. They've been working on this with me already, uh, preparing, doing the groundwork, especially Daphne has done some, some legwork here this time. So you've got several of us working on this and ultimately, uh, if necessary, we'll give you several alternatives to for you to make the ultimate decision, obviously. But we'll approach this like we did, like I did 10 years ago, working with the clerk. And, you know, this is not something that the staff decides, obviously. This is ultimately a decision you'll be making. Thank you, Mark. And as you probably got the feeling, no gerrymandering. Thank you, Mark. And I know you won't do that. Okay. On to item number four under miscellaneous. Resident tree removal request policy. Mark, I'll move approvals recommended by PRFC and finance. Need a second. This is Susan, I'll second. Okay, any questions or comments? Any questions or comments? I, if I don't see any raised hands. All those in favor of the resident tree removal request policy say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Aye. Okay, so the motion passes 7 1. We are on to item number five. This is the request for council reconsideration from May 18th to denial of tree removal at 7306 Allenwood Avenue. Um, Larry, do you want to restate this somehow? I mean, it's not really reconsideration, it's the submission of uh, new information. Uh, and you said it's set up a new item. Do you want to provide some input here, please? Well, the, the agenda item summary sheet accurately calls this a request for tree removal at 7306 Elmwood Avenue. So it's not technically speaking a reconsideration because there have been, what, four intervening council meetings so that it could not be reconsideration and comply with the parliamentary procedures for that. However, um, I do not think that is significant for purposes of open meetings law. Uh, all the information is 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 available. It's it's in the it's in the packet um, so that it it is properly before the council. And in addition, the the request um, is accompanied by a July 13, 2021 report, which clearly well, I'm, I shouldn't say clearly which states um, a claim of changed circumstances since the action of the council in, in May. So it's not a reconsideration in my opinion, and it is properly before the council as an independent request. Okay, so uh, uh, would it be okay to Go ahead with this then, or uh, how yes. about this? This is Kathy. I'll make a motion 
to have the tree removed and the cost to be uh, bore by the city as recommended by finance. This is Katie, I'll second. Okay, any questions or comments, please raise your hand. So this is Mark, I'll make a substitute motion that this be referred back to the city forester to comply with the policy that we just passed. Okay, need a second. This is Susan L. Second. Okay, any further question or comments on this uh, alternate mo um, second motion? So, I just had a, had a few comments. Substitute motion, yes. Yeah, right. <clears throat> the reality is, uh, if if as Larry has indicated, this is independent of other topics that the council has previously considered, then it is appropriate to follow the new policy that was just passed. Again, this is supposed to have the uh, review of the city forester to make a recommendation as to whether or not it's, an, it's a nuisance tree and, is, and can be appropriately taken down at the city's expense or whether there's a conflict. Right, that's why the policy was implemented. I think really what needs to happen here is just, uh, we need to be cognizant of the fact that if we pass policies, they need to be followed. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Kathy Olson? Um, yeah, this has, this followed policy. M Mark Wagner did his assessment. It went back to PRFC as Lance the policy says, PRFC unanimously approves the removal of this tree and it's time to move this on. The, this is a tree that is, it's, it's injured. Uh, the root system is, is out of control and it's injured people. It's just beyond time to have this removed. I, I'd, like to, I'd like to respond to that. What Go PRFC ahead. did and what council <laughs> did are two different things, right? What council said, the last time this came around was that we were going to do some trimming and then monitor this tree, right? So now if we want to start the clock over again, then we have to start the process over again. This should be, should be it is it, the best thing that this can happen is to make sure it's done appropriately by following the policy that we just passed. Thank you, Mark. Next one is Robert Burke and then Kathy Olson. Robert, and then Susan West. Robert Bart. Yeah, sorry, I clicked my microphone and it didn't go apparently. Um, so I, I have one question and maybe a comment as well. The question is, how long is this process going to take <coughs> uh, realistically? If, if it, if we're resetting the clock, we're sending it back to, um, you know, our forester, um, he's going to do another review. This is going to be, you know, go, go, I assume before uh, Parks and Rec, I think it is. And then, uh, and then if, I guess I'm just trying to understand, like, if we go through this whole process, when would we realistically expect an answer uh, on what direction to go and, 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 when, if, if, if it needs to go to this stage, when it would maybe go back to uh, uh, reconsideration, if, if, if again, uh, we get basically the same answer we had, well, before us tonight, really. Um, how, I guess I wanna know how long it would take. And then my comment is, when this came before us last time, um, my understanding was, uh, the, the homeowner was willing to remove the tree at her own cost. And because of our decisions and, and the, the, the choice to not do it, now it's being asked to do it at our cost. Um, you know, we've got, we've got a citizen here who is injured, upset, and I would just say that time is of the essence. So anything that we can do to quickly go through this process, um, would be helpful. So I, but I would like my first question answered if, if anybody can, how, what's a reasonable timeline for, for when the determination will be made 
whether to remove the tree completely or just trim tree trim trim branches. Thank you. Mark Wagner, if you're on the call, could you please respond? Mark Wagner or Matt uh, Amundsen. Um, sorry about that. Uh, the assessment can be done right away tomorrow. I guess it'd be more along the lines of how it would fit into the next layout for um, when PRFC meets and then Common Council. I don't know if it would make the next PRFC meeting or not, because the next one would be, what would that be? Would that be September 6th? Would that be the next PRFC one? No, I PRFC. think PRFC doesn't meet on the September 6th due to Labor Day. The next PRFC meeting would be the 20th. So then, you know, this, so then it would be that. And then uh, the subsequent um, council meeting after that. So I, given that, I mean, I don't see any reason why we wouldn't have it on that next PRFC agenda for the 20th. So the PRFC does not meet anymore in August? No, it does not. Okay, thank you, Mark. Okay, so Robert, that's your answer. Does thank that you. seem yes. okay to you? Or, uh, well, anyway. Well, it at least gives me a reasonable timeline for, depending on, on how the vote goes tonight, I, I at least know what the consequences of that vote could be. Thank you. Okay, so the next one is Kathy Olson and then Luke Puzard and then Susan West. Yeah, um, Robert, I just wanted to say, you mentioned the trimming of the branches. It's not the branches, that that is an issue with it. It's the roots, the roots are getting cut when they refix the sidewalks each time. These roots are so aggressive, they grow under, they grow over, and they're just too aggressive. And every time you cut it, the tree gets weaker and less stable. And when this was voted on at the council last time, yes, it was to get the policy. But at that time, I said, this is going to have to come back. It wasn't that we were going to wait the full two years for this to happen. And when we read the minutes back, I said, I just want you to, I want it recorded that this is coming back. We're not going to wait the full two years and trim branches and hope that this goes away. We have somebody that has gotten injured as a because of we didn't take action on this. And this is, a, it's this tree is a nuisance in every definition of what a nuisance tree is. It, it says, um, if it, in which it may endanger the life, health, safety, and welfare of a person or property of public or private. And this is a nuisance tree. Okay, are you done, Kathy? Yes. Okay, so the next one is Luke Buzard and then Susan West. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I think the, just to for uh, provide insight into kind of the, the fellow alders and my decision-making process when we've got uh, decisions about whether or not to refer a specific item back to a committee or committees, I always think, will that process in exchange for delaying allow us to come to a different conclusion? And I think if we really are honest with ourselves about this is that if it does even get referred, eventually it's going to come back. And I, I would imagine that the, the outcome is still going to be the same. And therefore, in the interest of um, expediting and, and, and expediency, I would highly recommend folks to just think about getting this over with tonight and moving forward. Thank you. Okay, you are done, Luke. Okay, Susan West. And then- uh, Yes, I have- then, 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 Susan, go ahead. Okay, I have a different opinion from Luke. I'm really concerned that because we're not, or people are suggesting we don't refer it back to PRFC, we are setting a precedent that we do not have to go by policies. And that's a big concern. Now, in terms of what Kathy's saying about it's a danger, I went by there today. I actually walked on the sidewalk. It's been replaced. It's nice. It's smooth. It's level. The route that is of concern is actually on city property. It's between the curb gutter and the driveway apron. So it's right there at the curb. I would suggest that city staff tomorrow go and cut off that piece of route. 
And then the more concerning thing to fix that problem is to repair the concrete around the curb apron. And then that would solve the immediate danger of where uh, the residents fell. But the sidewalks have been replaced, so they're smooth. So that's not an issue. There is a little bit of, you know, it's not completely level with the yard next to it. It goes up a little bit, but that's true all over the city. There are places where there's sidewalk next to a slope or hill. But in terms of the route, it's there on city property between the curb gutter and the driveway apron, and that the city can go cut off tomorrow. And that would solve the problem of removing the tripping hazard. And then we can do the right process by going, referring it back to PRFC for taking the whole tree down. Are you done, Susan? Yes. Okay, thank you, Susan. So the next one is Diane Ramsey and then, uh, then Katie Nelson. Um, I, I would like to concur with uh, with Luke. I, after listening to this conversation, both at finance and now at council, it's pretty apparent to me that everybody's going to land in the same spot that they are right now currently. And we're just basically what we're going to be doing is putting this decision off for six weeks. But we're going to be right about making the same decision. In the way that I look at it, um, and this, um, this tree fits uh, with the policy as far as it has been looked at, it has been discussed, the um, PRC voted on it. It's, um, I'm looking at this as the homeowner's appeal, if you will. And to, I, I, I think just to, to put this decision off for six weeks serves, serves no real good purpose whatsoever. That's all I have to say. Thank you, Dan. So the next one is uh, Katie Nelson. Um, I am, I'm sorry, I'm trying to lower my hand. I'm uh, concurring with Luke and with Dan on this. Um, I don't think trimming the root off, I mean, while it seems like an easy solution, this, if, Refresh my memory, it's the silver maple, yeah? Yes. Those are notorious nuisance trees. Um, it's just gonna continue. How many times has that section of sidewalk been replaced because of those roots? Um, I love trees, but uh, I think we can put a better one there. Are you done, Katie? I'm done. Okay, so the next one is uh, Betty Olson, then Luke, and then Susan. Rest. The the um, owner of this home has been contacting uh, PRC, the Forestry Department, since 2015, and this is their this item. This shouldn't have to rewind and go all the way back. This is this is an appeal of the of the decision. It's just. I'm just so frustrated with this that, um, and even according to the policy, they followed the the steps by documenting everything. They've taken it to PRFC as a as an appeal, or as a, and it's just this is going on way too long, and nothing is getting done. And it just is dangerous tree, and it's it's not going to get any better when you keep cutting roots off of it and making it any more stable. This tree is is going to cause a problem, bigger problem than it already has, actually. Beth, you're done. Yes. Okay. okay. Susan West. Okay. I'd like to say what I'm trying to do is a very practical thing. It's clear that council's going to vote tonight to remove the tree. But before the tree is removed and during the planning process for getting it done, and I don't know if we have to, if, you know, the city staff will have to hire someone to do it. I think it would be wise to have Public Works cut that piece of root off 
so that it immediately stops the problem. So is there a way to get public works to do that? Susan, I think that route was trimmed when they were out doing sidewalks. That's already been trimmed down. I well, think it, it could was be much trimmed more. Some more. It could be trimmed some more. And then that concrete needs to be dealt with because that's a tripping hazard. Are you done, Susan? Yeah, I would just like for this to get information, get to the appropriate people that can take care of it quickly because we don't need another accident. And that's independent of how we vote. There are two things that need to be done and that are independent of taking the tree down. So Sean Stowski or Mark Wagner, could you please answer that Susan's question? Mark Wagner or Matt Amundsen? Mayor, I'm here. I can't speak for Public Works and, and what they can or can't do. I'm not sure that um, that we, with with our staff, would have the capability of, of doing what Susan's asked. Okay. Sean Stowski, if you're there. Well, I am, but I haven't seen this particular tree either. I know we usually defer to the city forester on tree questions where there are conflicts with concrete work um, and try to take their best advice on either raising concrete to sort of hump over a tree root or cut the tree root. Usually in our contract, we, we, we usually have our contractor do that, not our own staff. Sean, can I interrupt you and explain a little better? The root is between the join for the gutter and the driveway apron. So it's in that crack. Next to it, where the driveway, where the curb cut curves into the driveway apron, that concrete is actually broken. Yeah. So I. And pictures I, uh... of aren't really fully showing all of that. Or maybe in cutting I, it off, I, I don't think we would be able to, with a chainsaw, try to shave off a root without getting into the concrete, which would have wreck a blade and maybe. But the bigger somehow. problem is there is a chunk of concrete that's broken. Susan, could, could, you, could, you, Susan, could you please let him answer that, if you don't mind? Go ahead, Sean, please. Well, I was just saying, I, I don't think we would use a chainsaw to try to grind a root down or shave it off without hurting somebody. So I, you know, it like the kind of thing that needs some other sort of um, saw or grinder or remove the concrete, cut the root and put the concrete back. I don't know. Well, it, it sounds like somebody would have to go out and take a look at it. We're, try, we're try, trying to to ask Sean what he can do about it by looking at a picture okay. and there's no, okay. no way of telling right. it. And Sean, yeah. do not take a chainsaw out there and try to do it. <laughs> we need to get the process Susan, the, go ahead, please. Susan, please go ahead. We need ahead. to yeah. get the process getting the curb fixed because it is broken. It's not showing in that picture. What well, can can we deal with And the, that's usually where we get the city forester's opinion to figure out how best to deal with that. Because I know our general guiding philosophy is we want to preserve trees and we'll move kind if we have to. But sometimes, uh, you know, we, we get the other answer, but that's the city forester's call, not mine. Okay, okay but once the tree's down, can okay. you fix the concrete? Yeah, that they, they will handle it at that time, Susan. So um, that's their job. Um, Mark Sullivan, you had your hand up. Yeah, I just wanted to make a point that um, what we're what seems to be happening here is that the council is telling the entire constituents of the city is that it really doesn't matter what the policies say that you can just make a big stink and get whatever done that you want done. And we are going down a slippery slope here if we don't allow the policies that we've implemented to work the way that they're supposed to work. 
I understand there's a lot of uh, angst about getting this taken care of, but uh, it, it's more important from the way that we run the city that we allow the policies that we put into place to work as they're in, intended. You're done, Mark? Yep. Okay, thank you. So the next one is Kathy Olson and then Susan West. Oh, no, I'm lowering my hand. Oh, okay. Kathy Olson? Mark, I, Mark Sullivan, um, calling this making a big stink, I think is pretty offensive to someone that has to go see an orthopedic surgeon. I, I think this is a sincere, real issue and concern and the city sh should have taken action a long time ago. Thank you. Okay, I don't see any raised hands. So the motion is to refer this to PRFC. Mark, that was the motion, right? Yes. Okay. All those in favor of the motion say aye. Aye. Okay, so we probably need roll call vote, please. So, Mike. Mike, could you please have a roll call vote? Yes. Councilmember Olson. No. Burke. No. Nelson. No. Kuhn. Yes. Gussard. No. West. Yes. Ramsey. Sorry, I was muted. No. Sullivan. Yes. Okay, so the motion fails three to five. Okay, so what is the, Larry, do we need to, what do we need to do now? Go back to the original motion. Okay, so we are working on the original motion. That is to remove the tree at 7306 Allenwood Avenue. So, Mike, why don't you take a roll call vote for this one too, so. All right, we'll stop. We'll start the opposite direction now. Uh, Council Member Sullivan. Can I just say that this was also to remove the tree and the city will bear the cost? Yeah, it's that was the motion. motion. That was the motion. All right, Council Member Sullivan. No. Ramsey? Yes. West? No. Jussard? Yes. Kuhn? Yes. Nelson? Yes. Burke? Yes. Olson? Yes. I believe that's six to two. Okay, motion passes six to two. All right, let's move on to the next item. That is the Hmm. Item number six. This is the tax incremental district. Did number five draft amendment number one for council preview and discussion. So, hmm. well, Mayor, um, I had asked uh, Abby to put this in the council packet so mm -hmm. that if you had any questions about the amendment. It, it's actually going to the Joint Review Board on Friday, and it will be back to the Planning Commission and the Council in September uh, for review and, and approval. And then uh, back to the Joint Review Board again. And then eventually on to the Department of Revenue. After the Joint Review Board reviews it again. Yes. yes. Right. Thank this you, Larry. Initial meeting of the board the Joint Board of Review. Yes, on, um, thank you. Guys. This on, Friday morning. On 20th, yes, at 9 a.m. So- Because it does affect, um, um, I believe five council districts altogether, maybe six. And uh, there are some significant changes in the amendment to TID 5 in bringing it all the way to University Avenue. We worked hard to try to make that happen knowing that uh, the interest in redevelopment 
of University Avenue. And without TIF as part of that, it is uh, significant. So um, if you have questions, Abby, Bill, and I could uh, work to address those. Any questions for Mike or Abby? Otherwise, uh, this will provide an opportunity to go through this uh, and it will come back to the city council at the next meeting. Any questions or comments? It's only for discussion. Okay, I don't see any raised hands. So we're gonna move on to the next item, which is the ordinances. The first, this is the first reading. Final action may be taken upon approval of the motion to suspend rules under section 1.07 Middleton General Ordinances. Item number one, an ordinance to amend section 15.056D relating to the temporary no parking zones. Need a motion to approve. This is Luke, I'll uh, make that motion. Okay, need a second. I apologize, I should have said, um, to suspend the rules and approve. Okay, all right, thank you, Luke. Need a second. As you can read here, it's no person shall park any vehicle within any temporary designated under subparagraph uh, one or two of this paragraph. So very simple. And need a second? Rams, your second. Okay, any questions or comments? Okay, Robert Burke. Thank you. Um, from the way this is described, it says uh, we're changing this to spell out the enforcement action, which I assume is partly the consequences. Um, so it's just the consequences of no person shall park any vehicle within any temporary no parking zone. Where where is it in subparagraph one or two that spells out? what happens when somebody does park in one of these areas is like don't do this but there's no teeth to it where are oh, the teeth oh. they they get a ticket the, the okay. problem with ordinance as it was before it it said there were temporary no parking zones in and but then didn't say what happened and this now creates the enforcement authority for the ordinance okay that's it, um, it doesn't seem like it says what the teeth are, but like, I mean, just a sentence that would say, and, and, and citations can be given or, but, but if, if everybody else thinks that, that this comes, has teeth. That comes later in the, in the ordinance, it applies okay. to all. all okay, and thank, thank you for that clarification. I have no further questions. Thank you, Robert. Any other questions or comments? All those in favor of the, Motion to approve an ordinance to amend section 15.046D relating to temporary no parking zones and the rules are suspended under section 1.07. So this will be the final reading. Say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? So the motion passed unanimously. Recommendation proposals, uh, item number one, ARPA water utility project proposal. Do we need to vote on this one or it's mainly for discussion? I'll move that we defer this to the budget process as recommended by finance. Okay. Second. Okay. Susan, you have your hand up? Yeah, I have a question and I think yep. Probably, if I'm correct, by deferring it to the budget process, it means that we'll look at all of these proposals for ARPA funds and then choose which ones we want from different categories. That's my understanding of what we're doing with this, right? So all the, all the ARPA proposals would be uh, discussed during the budgeting cycle, separate from the capital discussions, separate from the operating discussions. Okay. And also, would, so, yes, would, Susan, we, go ahead. would we be putting sort of priorities of importance on different ones? Of course. And also, we would um, you know, like stormwater, we've got a whole list of them. So, would we be more considering the top ones based in terms of greatest need? I guess it's what 
what I'm asking. Well, I think those are just those are discussions that finance will have to have. But I, I could imagine that, you know, um, certainly we need to take into consideration projects that will uh, reduce cost for the for in, in future city budgets. That that's one thing. Um, I I think stormwater may have a. a uh, we haven't set any priorities yet, put it that way. So I think those are discussions we have to have. Okay. Are you done, Susan? Yes. Okay. Dan Ramsey? Yeah, some of the committees already are looking at some of the ideas and prioritizing what they think um, would be a good use of some of these funds. So I, I think that when we get to that process, um, there'll be, shall we say, a rough draft of priorities. Yep. Uh, so we will have complete information and we will be able to handle it at that time. Okay, so motion is to defer until the to the budgeting process. All those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Motion passed unanimously. We are on to the resolutions. Resolution item number one. This is uh, resolution 2021-31 approving grant of underground gas main easement to Madison Gas and Electric Company in the city of Middleton, North Mundota Trail. Need a motion to approve. This is Robert. I would make a motion to approve. This Need is Susan second. second. Okay, any, ready? Before you go further, this- Go ahead, go ahead, Larry. We, we had some, some trouble with vacations and things didn't get reviewed properly. This is actually should be titled, and I think there is a replacement document. I'm not sure though. It's actually a resolution approving a release of an underground gas main easement, not a grant. Um, okay. You'll see that attachment one is a release. And then exhibit A to that is the easement that's being released. So this is actually a release. Sorry about okay. that. Okay. So, well, um, subject to the attorney's approval. So would that take care of it? Sure. Okay. Robert, is that okay with you? It is. Thank you. All right. Well, although I would note, I think we need to actually have the words release of uh, underground gas easement in the minutes. Okay. Yes. Okay. So. It's the approval of a release and of underground gas main easement of Madison Gas and Electric. Right. So that's okay with Larry, Robert, and the person who seconded. Dan Ramsey. Okay. All yeah. those in favor of the motion of uh, approving the resolution 2021-31, approving a release of underground gas main easement to Madison Gas and Electric Company in the city of Middleton, and this also includes the Tony's approval. All those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Motion passes. We are on to the next item. That is resolution 2021-40, approving relocation of underground gas main treatment to Madison Gas and Electric Company. Larry, do you have any comments before I ask for the... Uh, well, um, I say that again, Mr. Mayor. Oh, I'm asking Larry if he has anything. Oh, to I didn't say hear you. Me. Thank you. Oh, yeah. sorry. What happened previously is the council approved a grant of an underground gas main easement that was mostly over private property, but there was a little sliver of it that is over public property. It was approved but never implemented so that. After that happened, um, MG&E has requested that it be uh, wider uh, because of the considerations of other land uses in the area. So that even though you, this, is, this has already been approved once as release, because this is now a larger area slightly than the previous one, um, we're asking for approval since it encumbers a little more land. Okay, so the way this resolution is written is okay with you? Yes, other than putting the number in the title. Okay, 
Rains, okay. you move to approve. Okay, need a second. Second. Okay, Mark <clears throat> Opitz, do you have your hand up? Well, I, I simply wanted to explain that at the time you adopted this in May, uh, the previous version, it was like day or two later when MGE &E signaled to us that, wait a minute, we want to change the resolution, the area. We may want to change the area, but they didn't give us that new definition until earlier this month. So this would have come to you a long time ago, but MGE &E was still trying to adjust the parameters of their project. This is to relocate the high pressure gas main. Um, I'm happy to report that they have uh, modified their project in a way that doesn't encumber the Middleton Shores property to the west. And they've also obtained the consent of the Harbor Village folks to the east. And pardon me, I have an assistant here who's not happy with me. So <laughs> the Harbor Village condo folks have been very gracious in allowing an expanded easement on their property and allowing construction vehicles to and, and equipment to be on their property to accommodate this work. So this has been a long time in the making here, but uh, we finally have the limits defined and the consent of the adjoining property owners. Thank you, Mark. This will help the North Murota Trail project move forward. Okay, any other questions or comments from the city council? Okay, the motion is to approve the resolution 2021-40, approving relocation of the underground gas main easement to Madison Gas and Electric Company for North Murota Trail and subject to attorney approval. All those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Motion passed unanimously. Indeed, a motion to go into closed session. This is Robert Burke. I would make a motion to convene in the closed session. Okay, need a second. I'll second. This is Katie. Okay, the motion by Robert and second by Katie to go into closed session. All those in favor of the motion to go into closed session say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Okay, Mike, so let's 